Listen in as a psychologist shares how he was booked solid three months into the opening of his private practice. Oh, and a little warning, we both crack some pretty ordinary jokes throughout. Sorry. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now here's your host, Tim Reid. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some marketing that is going to build your business into the booming baby it's meant to be. And we are brought to you by the very good folk at Net Registry and the very good folk at 99designs, who both are there to help improve your marketing. More on that later. Big episode, team. Big episode. As I said out the front there, I have a psychologist who's going to share how he's built a very successful practice using some beautifully simple marketing ideas and techniques. I've got a listener question about how to effectively thank clients I take you inside the last couple of weeks of my working life and a bit of a small business big marketing forum update. So much marketing gold, so little time. Small business big marketing with Tim Reid. So I get a lot of listeners email me saying, what do you do when you're not podcasting, Timbo? And a few episodes ago, I did share my travel schedule because generally that's what I do. I travel around Australia and the world, speaking to motivated small business owners about how to improve their marketing. Outside of podcasting, really, I am a keynote speaker, I suppose it would be fair to say. Last couple of weeks, been to Victor Harbour down in South Australia, where I spoke to the Caravan and Camping Association of South Australia. Great bunch of people, very motivated. I spoke at Melbourne's Crown Casino to Jim's building Inspecting inspectors, inspectors. <laughs> it's a franchise group that uh, are doing very nice things. It was their first inaugural national conference. I have been to Fiji, where I spoke to at the Bridgestone uh, National Tires Conference. That was interesting. Fiji, what about Fiji? Fiji time, more to the point. You don't want to be in a hurried team if you go to that beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And I have been to Brisbane just at the end of last week where I spoke to about 200, 250 IT professionals as part of the ConnectWise group um, get-together. Great bunch of people, by the way. Thank you to Mark Meppyman for uh, referring me into that one. And hello to Zorn and Nick, who very, very kindly made me feel very welcome. They were the organisers of the conference. And... Um, Unbeknownst to me, Zorn in particular is a long time listener of this show, like almost from day one, if not day one. So it's so good to meet people who have been with me along this long, long journey, which is now over 200 episodes. So it was great to meet Zorn and the great bunch at ConnectWise. And then a couple of days ago, I just got back from Port Douglas in far north Queensland where I spoke to a bunch of insurance brokers. So many different industries, but we're all battling with the same marketing problems, the same limiting beliefs around our marketing, which this show aims to put to bed forever. And between all that travel, I have been inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum every day or so, answering questions of motivated business owners. And in fact, this morning, ran a webinar called Pod- Podcast Like a Rockstar. It was an exclusive webinar for forum members where we smash through all the questions they have around getting their own podcast up and running. So um, that was fantastic. And I upload that, I recorded it, and that sits in the classroom section of the forum. So, hey, if you are listening and you're not a forum member, huh, gee, I think it's time to take the leap. 49 bucks a month, and uh, I'm in there answering your questions. There's a bunch of other motivated business owners answering questions, asking questions, and just keeping us all, each other, accountable and motivated to grow a great business. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the forum button, and you will be there quicker than you can say, why didn't I join earlier? 
Okay, bit of sponsorship loving because this show cannot happen without that love that comes from my sponsors. So, Net Registry, gee, they're good guys because they help grow your business online. That's what they're there to do. You see, they help you get all sorts of things sorted like domain name selection and registration, website design and hosting, helping you get found on Google. They can even set you up with an email marketing campaign. So they can cover all the bases of getting you sorted online. And you know, ensuring you have a decent digital footprint is pretty critical when marketing your business. You are who Google says you are, team. Hey? Scary as that may sound, and you know, your digital footprint goes way beyond having a website. There's other things you've got to do, and Net Registry know how to do them. So head over to netregistry.com.au today and say, see how you can get your online marketing sorted. It'll be much cheaper and easier than you think. Netregistry.com.au and tell them Timbo sent you. I don't reckon I've done a listener question for a few weeks, so let's do one. I've got a few piling up. This one's from David Carter. Thanks for your question, Dave. He says, Timbo, I love your show. (laughs) Thanks, Dave. It's been a great help as I try to grow my business as an employee of a physiotherapy clinic. Love it. Good on you for being an employee and motivated enough to uh, help them smash out some good marketing, David. He says, I would like to know what the best way to thank customers for referring their friends to our clinic is. A thank you with a card, a small gift, an email with some useful content. What should I do? Yours in health, Dave. Well, let me give you some ideas, Dave. Six or seven ideas, in fact. Firstly, firstly, well done. Well done on even thinking of thanking. Because you know what? I don't think we do it enough. Just, you know... Stop, everyone, stop right now. Turn the show off and go and ring a past client and thank them for their business. And then turn the show back on and start listening again. But we don't thank enough, so well done to you, Dave. Um, And whatever you do from a thank you point of view, make it heartfelt, okay? Not some cookie-cutter approach, but make it heartfelt. I check into a lot of hotels And every now and then, I get a handwritten card from the hotel manager thanking me for my custom. Now, whether he wrote it or whether his PA wrote it, I don't know. But it wasn't printed on some bubble jet dot matrix printer. There's no such thing as a combined bubble jet dot matrix printer, but you know what I mean. So no cookie cutter approach. Make your thank you heartfelt. Here's some ideas, Dave. Phone them. Hey, just phone them. Pick the phone up. Say thank you. Uh, Write a personal card, borrowing from the five-star hotel experiences that I have every now and then. Go to fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, and have a nice little fun personalized animation made up for five, ten, fifteen bucks. There's plenty of them there. Um, Run exclusive info sessions for referees only. So the referees are already patients of your physiotherapy clinic. So run exclusive sessions that only they get invited to, and the sessions are all about how to live a healthier life, how to, or you know, around well-being and whatever. So your nice exclusivity is good. Another idea: send them a book, a signed book. Maybe find out what uh, subjects they're interested in, what topics they're interested in. Send them a nice book. I do love receiving books. Feel free to send as many books as you want, listeners. PO Box nine eight nine, Mount Eliza, Victoria. 3930. <laughs> I get a few books sent to me. I quite like that because I do like reading. Uh, level of thanks. Yes, okay. You can, you can have levels of thanks too. So, you know, for someone who refers a client, just send them, uh, just call them or send them an email. Uh, who, who refers two clients, you might, you know, do something, you might up it a little bit. Five clients might, when they receive a book, 10 referrals is when they get exclusive, an exclusive invite to an information session, etc., etc. And last but not least, in episode 149 of this show, Dave, I interviewed a fellow, Andrew Matner. He's an accountant in South Australia. 90% of his business comes from referrals, 90%. And he is nailing the whole referral process. And he explains exactly how 
in that episode. I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode 202 over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Hey, Andrew, thanks for your, uh, Andrew, Dave, thanks for your question, mate. Listeners, if you've got a marketing question, send it to, uh, you, actually, where you can send it to is go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the contact button, and there's a little box there to send me a question. Love it. <laughs> Now, last week, I very proudly announced the new sponsorship of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, welcoming 99designs.com on board. Very excited to have them as a partner because they really, really help small businesses with all aspects of design. Basically, you can get the design you love at a price you can afford starting at $299. I know. You can get logos designed, business cards, mobile apps, t-shirts, banners, car wraps, brochures, book covers, illustrations, you name it. There's there's pretty much nothing. You can't get designed at 99designs. They've got over 800,000 designers on their books. Here's how it works. You run a design competition. So you post a brief and 99 Designs walk you through all the questions you need to answer to to complete a fantastic brief. Then you sit back over the course of seven days and watch as dozens of designers submit their finished concept. Now, as part of your brief, you'll have nominated some prize money, okay? And that prize money goes to the winning designer. Now, the winning designers over the, the designers, I should say, over the course of the week submit their finished designs in low res. You give feedback to them, shape their to help them shape their ideas. You shortlist it down, and then at the end of seven days, you award the prize money. You are likely to get dozens and dozens of designers um, submitting entries to your design brief. It's amazing. Now, uh, it's and it's really simple too, by the way. As I said, starting at $299. Now, as an exclusive to listeners of this show, you can get a free power pack upgrade worth $99. And it includes a bold listing highlighted with prominent backgrounds, featured above all the regular listings, and how's this? It results, on average, a 185% increase in the amount of designs you can expect to receive. How do you get that upgrade? Go to 99designs.com forward slash SBBM for small business big marketing. And you can claim that upgrade immediately. How cool is that? So welcome aboard again, 99designs. Head over there, team, 99designs.com forward slash SBBM. Righto, today's guest, let's get stuck in for a fireside chat with psychologist Lindsay Spencer Matthews. Lindsay happens to be a member of the Small Business Big Marketing Forum, and he is doing mighty things. He is a fully registered psychologist with a very successful private practice, and that is why I chose to get him on the show. He's been practicing psychology for 20 years. He is in his 60s, by the way, so he hasn't been a psychologist all his life. He'll go into a bit of that up the top end of this interview. What I love about my chat with Lindsay, he doesn't have any magic tricks up his sleeve, but he's nailing the basics of business and of good old-fashioned marketing. It's a really, really, um, I, I think, an uplifting chat. Okay, We talk a lot about online marketing on this show. Not everything is online, and I often say, you know, the old school marketing sits beautifully alongside the new world of marketing, and that's what I got out of um, out of our chat today. Lindsay is really nailing the new world of marketing. So take a listen. We have some fun along the way, a bit of a hit and a giggle amongst some very serious marketing conversation. So without further ado, here is Lindsay Spencer Matthews. <laughs> How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Okay, now I think I know the answer to this. Um, Go for it. Oh, gee, I read it last night. Um, (laughs) Only one, but the light bulb really needs to want to change. That's it, Tim. Uh, and that's a very – I love the humour inherent in it, but I also love the fact that it's legitimate, that on the rare occasions where I get an unmotivated client walk into my room, it's almost impossible at the very at the very best. It's a very hard work. But uh, you're looking for motivated small businesses. I'm looking for motivated people who want to change. Yeah, I love that, mate. Well, listen, um, I think what I'll do is um, 
We'll just put the dad joke kind of alert out there right now because I do get accused of them. And if this interview at any point I feel as though needs a little bit of a tickle, um, I will drop a psychologist joke. In fact, I'm going to do it right now because I've got so many that I could be dropping. Okay, Okay. here we go. Doctor, doctor, I think I'm a cat. How long has this been going on? Since I was a kitten. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. On behalf of the potential listener of this show, could I ask you to stop, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely not, because they can just turn off. Hey, now, listen, let's get stuck in, because we have got so much to cover. You, yeah. You're a, a practicing psychologist, from what I understand, for over 20 years, but mm. in a previous life, you've worked in sales, lecturing, training, you've built two small businesses, and it was only three years ago that you started what is now a very successful private practice. What took you so long? <laughs> well, I'm a slow learner, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, from a psychological perspective, I didn't really have my uh, road to Damascus experience, my kind of genesis moment until I was in my early 30s. I was on uh, what I now refer to as automatic pilot as a psychologist. I was just you know, running on automatic and doing all the things that people were expected to do, get a job, have a wife, the two kids. And uh, I didn't really wake up to myself till I was in my uh, early 30s. And uh, I was incredibly fortunate that I was a, an accidentally gifted salesperson. And so I was able to make a reasonably comfortable living during all those years. But, uh, yeah, I, I kind of fell out of love with doing that. So, uh, so did you... Um did you, at that point of being a salesperson and a lecturer, a trainer, having your own small businesses, were you a qualified psychologist then? No, no, I was, oh. I was thirty-six before I went to university. So, what was this? Uh, what was this genesis moment? I haven't heard that phrase before. What was that moment? Was this an epiphany that you had in your early thirties? Yes, it absolutely was. Oh, you got um, it, Lindsay. I, I love epiphanies because I just I don't think I've had one, and I kind of want one. Oh, I don't know whether you do, Tim. Mm. I don't, uh, but anyway, let me tell you uh, my moment. And this is an incredibly personal moment. Uh, I've only shared this with one or two people in the world. Um, but I was in, a, uh, in a, a struggling marriage and I had been out and done a very difficult and protracted sales call to a potential client. Uh, and driving home, I burst into tears. Mm-hmm. And I, I had no idea why. And it was such a torrent of, uh, of tears that I couldn't drive. I had to pull over and stop. And it took probably 45 minutes for me to regain control of myself. And uh, at the end of that time, I was sitting there by the side of the road uh, feeling like I was insane. I honestly thought I'd lost my mind. And uh, what I later realized was that part of my gift as a salesperson was to completely empty myself of my own baggage and be there 100% for my client. And finally, the uh, the return of my own baggage was so overwhelming to me that uh, it just uh, had that incredible uh, epiphany moment. And, uh, and it literally uh, changed the way I thought about myself and my life. And uh, the next two or three years were very difficult as I tried to resolve that uh, the marriage. Uh, it ultimately failed, and I moved on. And through a set of uh, fairly extraordinary circumstances, ended up deciding to become a psychologist and going to university. Did you? Beca- First of all, thank you for sharing that. That's probably what a psych- psychologist says to their client. But quite seriously, thank you for sharing such a personal moment, uh, Lindsay. And, and and second to that, um, did you did you then choose to go into psychology um, because you thought there were other people have, that have been through what you'd just been through and you wanted to help them? I wish I could say I was that altruistic, Tim. Uh, the the circumstances that led to me becoming a psychologist was that my by then ex wife was concerned of, over the developmental issues with my now thirty nine year old son. Uh, and uh, so at her uh, insistence, I went to visit the psychologist that uh, she had taken my son to, and uh, this guy gave me some fantastic advice, offered to do some uh, intellectual and uh, career kind of testing on me, which uh, I I jumped at, and at the end of it he said, you can do whatever you like, but uh, I'd like to think of you becoming a psychologist, and it was as uh, as pragmatic as that, Tim, I, uh, and, and I, I fell in love with the industry as I began to uh, to learn it and to become qualified in it and then ultimately to practice it. And uh, you know, now, 20 years on, uh, it's one of the things that brings me incredible joy. But, uh, it, it, yeah, sadly, there was no, no nobility mm. involved in choosing the career. 
So you became a qualified psychologist late in your 30s. You didn't Actually, start... in, my, in my early 40s. I'm 60, 63 now, Tim. Okay, so uh, you didn't start your own private practice until three years ago. What did you do between becoming qualified and starting what you have with this now successful business? Okay, when I first qualified, I was focusing on organisational psychology and that's what led me to become a, a lecturer and a consultant to business, uh -huh. uh, and that worked well. Uh, I then uh, began uh, not only my own private practice, but my second small business was um, a group of psychologists working in medical practices. Because back then, uh, we're talking about the very early 90s, uh, there were no medical rebates for psychologists as there are some now, um, and so it was very difficult to build an income out of a private psychological practice. And so I built a network of, I think at, the, at its peak there were 26 psychologists working in 30 medical practices across Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my plan was for me to take 10% of their of what they earned, uh, and that would fund the marketing and management of the network. Uh, now it it, uh. it it was a success from the constituents' point of view. Uh, now the psychologists became busier than they were, uh, but the 10% was always too small an ask, and uh, I never made money out of it. Uh, but it was a phenomenal learning uh, uh, opportunity, and I had no regrets about having done it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it ultimately reached its end when uh, my wonderful wife was invited to, uh, she was a, uh, an academic, and she was invited to open a campus of a new university in Brisbane, and that prompted us moving to Queensland. So I uh, handed over the reins of the uh, of, of that particular network to the network, uh, and it quietly floundered, and uh, I don't think it exists anymore. Sounds, Lindsay, like you've had um, you, you've had some goes at starting small businesses, and and it feels like there's been some. You might have kind of had some rather large financial hurdles along the way because even stopping <laughs> late, and correct me if I'm wrong, but stopping at late thirties, because I know there's listeners, there's people who listen to this show who are either in a small business that they don't like and want to do something that they love, or there's people trapped in cubicles who want to start a small business and bring their yep. idea to life. And finance, the cash flow thing is a huge hurdle. Now, two things that are here. One is that you stopped work you've had a you've effectively had a breakdown you didn't use those words correct me if i'm wrong but yeah, well yeah i think you're right here right. yeah. okay so you had a breakdown you've gone back to study so breakdown says to me you've kind of got to stop working or stop earning your earning ability decreases going back to study says particularly a, psycholo a psychology degree which is intense says that you would have had to have stopped earning then you've started a business that was good for those working for it but was earning you nothing so have you had some kind of financial hurdles along the way? And if you have, what have you done? Um, well, I'm reminded of the scene in Finding Nemo yeah. where, where Dory is encouraging Marlon to dive down to the bottom of the ocean to recover the mask that they had the address written on. And Marlon was fearful of the dark. And Dory sang a little song, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> and that's really all you can do, Tim. You know, the, uh, you occasionally buy a lotto ticket, and you know, that's <laughs> yep. but you, know, you do that in the almost inevitable knowledge that it's not going to help you. But the reality is all you can do is put one foot before the other, as uh, you know, a, a mutual colleague, Glenn Carlson, says, lean mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the... Uh, when times are financially tough, you've got to do what you've got to do. And it, it, during that time, I didn't completely abandon work. Um, I, uh, I am a pretty good salesperson, mm -hmm. uh, and so I was able to maintain some income during that time. And I had the incredible support of my wonderful wife, Sarah, as well. She uh, maintained a full-time uh, income until we had our son in 2001. So, yeah, it, it, I, I didn't actually live in a garret for that time, but it was a pretty mean existence. We, uh, you know, we, we were pretty much hermits. We, you know, we did what we had to do to survive. But really all you can do is put one foot in front of the other. I haven't had the opportunity. I, I, too, love the phrase lean in, and that's what you did. Uh, I, too, use it, and I use it both in terms of speaking to others but also as a kind of motivation to myself. I haven't I haven't dissected it, and I think you'd be a good person to dissect it with because I want every listener to lean in to what it is they do. So can we just spend a minute, Lindsay, maybe pulling it apart? What does lean in mean to you? 
It means making the decision to utterly and completely commit yourself. Uh, there is some fairly spectacular research coming out relating to the, uh, the deliberate nature of happiness, uh, that there is a, a kind of a general opinion that people are either happy or they're not happy. Uh, there is some research relating to proliferation of choice. Having too much choice tends to make people less happy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you narrow your choices down to the point where it's either do this or crash and burn, the notion of happiness attaches itself to the thing that you decide to do. And it's the, aver- it's the avoidance of crashing and burning that motivates you and maintains that happiness. Uh, so that, that's one of the ways that I would picture leaning in. Uh, you know, it's that absolute commitment and seeking joy from what you are committed to doing. Bloody but, scary. Oh, terrifying. It's actually a, a, a for, <laughs> it, it is a surfing and a skateboarding term. I think that's where it comes from, whereas you, you lean in to a wave, you lean into a corner, you mm-hmm. get complete grip, you get complete traction. If yep. you lean back, you will fall yep. and it will fall end in tears, yep. fall on your backside. Yep. And so, the, 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 the parallel there also is that once you've leant in, and you have achieved or got closer to achieving what you want to, there is a post-terror euphoria which kicks in, and it's an indescribable feeling. But once you've leant in and succeeded, you never stop. You never ever want to stop leaning in again. The idea of leaning in, and you know, I try to practice it. I talk about it. Sometimes it's just too scary, and you know, to lean in to you, know, you really leaned in to becoming a qualified psychologist and didn't look back it despite the fact that you know you were in a fairly dark time in your life and i know there's listeners who are gone Gee, i'd love to lean into bringing my such and such such business to life or taking it to the next level or becoming you know a person that i just would dream of becoming but i don't think i can it's like how do you, uh, big question t- for another time but is it one thing that uh, would allow you to look that fear in the face and lean in uh, the, the thing, the, the terror that relates to leaning in, I suspect relates to the reality gap between your current level of skill, expertise, experience and knowledge and where leaning in will take you to. And if that's too big a gap, if I decided I wanted to stop becoming a psychologist and become a neurosurgeon, uh, there's a massive uh, learning opportunity, financial uh, experience gap between the me now and the me that I might want to be if I become a neuroscientist. Uh, And that would probably stop me doing it, that degree of terror. Uh, So the the achievability of leaning in, I would hate to learn how to uh, free base jump by jumping off a mountain. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I'd want to learn parachuting first and get accustomed (laughs) to what it was like and gradually close the reality gap between where I'd ultimately like to be and where I am today. So that the notion of just jumping off the cliff to start a small business, for example, worries me as a psychologist because I know from the thousands of people I've spoken with as a psychologist and as a business person, people go into things emotionally rather than intellectually. Oh, yeah. And it's the lack of knowledge that causes them to crash and burn. Um, <clears throat> I've been a surfer. And uh, you, know, you fall off the board an awful lot of times before you get to experience it, but you've got to lean in every time. Uh, but the, the fall isn't damaging. Uh, so true. I, I was in a motorbike shop the other day with past guest Brad Smith, and he was picking up a couple of bikes. We were doing a speaking job together, and we haven't, so we're just traveling around between actually, uh, I won't say where because it'll give away the bike shop, but <laughs> this. Um, this guy, we got talking to the owner of this new bike shop, and you know, I said, "How come you, you just opened the shop? How come?" I've always wanted to own a bike shop. Now, to me, that is a real warning sign that I'm wondering whether he's done it for the right reason. Mm. He, he was incredibly emotional about it. Now, he could say, "Well, he's so passionate about it that it, it can only but succeed." But sometimes that passion can get in the way of good business sense. Yes, I'm reminded of the uh, old Kevin Costner film, The Field of Dreams, the if you build it, you will, they will come phenomenon. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, there are some people that have built successful businesses, and I would hope that your bike shop proprietor is one of those, where they've followed their passion and they've put the huge investment and they've lent into it, and it's yielded phenomenal results for them. I, it's 
brilliant when that happens. Unfortunately, you and I both know that small business, that the small business highway is littered with the wrecks of uh, of those experiences where the people have gone into it emotionally, and the market has gone. Huh, so what? And mm. they've crashed and burned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh. So- Correct. Well, that's why people listen to this show, Lindsay, because oh. there is a little bit of marketing gold, thanks to guests like you, that they can take away and implement in their business and maybe not dampen their passion, but put some commercial checks in place. Hey, um, oh, look, why not another joke? Hey, why, why not? Did you, did I, you say- Can I give you one, Tim? If you've got one as good as this one, go for it. I'll, we'll, we'll play, um, we'll, we'll play swords or what do you call it? You know, one-upmanship. <laughs> Okay, well, feel free to edit this one out if yeah, it's no go. good. Yeah. Um, uh, a, chap, a gentleman came into the psychologist and said, uh, I'm coming to you because everybody ignores me. And the psychologist said, next. <laughs> righto, righto. Receptionist to psychologist. Doctor, there's a patient here who thinks he's invisible. Tell him I can't see him right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, Tim, boom, boom. I wonder if there's anyone left listening. <laughs> Let's make some just stupid claim and see if they are. <laughs> hey, now, well, Lindsay. Let's uh, not. You'll get me re- deregistered, too. <laughs> correct, <laughs> correct. A psychologist with a sense of humour. Get rid of him. <laughs> now, let's let's talk business. Three years ago, you finally start your own private practice, and within months, you are solidly booked. How did you do that? Yeah, well, uh Again, uh, chance played its part. Uh, I had a conversation with a colleague who mentioned that they had some availability in the rooms that they occupied, and uh, and I, my ears pricked up. I was currently, at the time, I was in middle management as a senior psychologist team leader, and I've always hated middle management. I think it's a desert. <laughs> and um, Hello to all you middle managers out there. Absolutely. I hope you're experiencing the stuff that flows up and the stuff that flows down because it all smells the same. <laughs> oh, goodness. Sorry, Tim, that's getting No, it absolutely. Bring it on, I say. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I had been toying with the idea but was terrified of uh, engaging in private practice because the mortgage, the private school fees, all those sort of things still have to be paid. So this opportunity was a very – it lowered the barrier to entry that I didn't have to commit myself to paying weekly rent. This particular colleague was willing to let me have the room and just pay for the hours that I used. Wow. So that was the impetus to get in. I then drew upon all those years of sales and marketing stuff that I kind of uh, was in my DNA, and uh, I immediately wrote a blanket letter to every GP in the catchment area that I was in because a lot, an overwhelming amount of a psychologist's work comes from referral from GPs. Uh, and as you know, a new entrant to the market is either going to have to steal a slice of somebody else's pie, make the pie bigger, or cook a new pie. And uh, I knew that the GPs were unlikely to see me as given that it's illegal in my industry to claim superiority over anybody else, uh, I was not able to say, wow, send clients to me because I'm the best psychologist you'll ever meet. I would have been deregistered in a heartbeat. Um, the, uh, the, the Making the new pie, uh, they're a pretty jaded market. I wasn't able to say, here's my new approach to psychology. Uh, so I literally had to steal market share from other psychologists. And... My approach was very direct. Uh, I took some fairly basic marketing things. Uh, uh, one of the things that I do tend to do differently uh, is seek very specific feedback from my clients, both on how they perceive the relationship with me to be progressing, but also uh, on a session-by-session basis, I invite my clients to reflect on how their well-being is on a numerical scale. And so I promised to tell these GPs that I would update them on the progress of their patients that they referred to me on a regular and empirical basis with numbers rather than just the client going back and saying, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy and I'm feeling a bit better having spoken to him. There would actually be numbers behind it. Um, And uh, that began a trickle of clients to me. Uh, One of my passionate beliefs about business is that one of the – Fundamentals of business is you've got to do your business the best you can do. And as you know, I was most taken with the Jaco Caravan guy who said he wakes up every day dissatisfied with the way he did business the day before. Mm. And so the, the notion of constant improvement at, along, on top of excellence uh, underlies almost everything I try to do. I, and I, think, so- I, I think, and you're on a roll, so I don't hold that <laughs> thought, but I think that 
passion. It's one of the great things about small business, Lindsay, is that as the owners, we have – well, you can do that whether you're in small business or whether you're middle manager, you're looking to improve what you did yesterday. But, you know, when it's our business and it's our passion, the ability to want to do that is, is just – it's wonderful. I think it's what keeps many of us going. You're right. Um, and mine's an odd business. Um it's a contrary sort of a business because I measure success by the amount of change that occurs in my client's perspective and the degree of ability they develop to manage their own life and their own life circumstances. I don't believe that my industry is the advice-giving industry. My job as a psychologist is not to tell people what to do. My job is to try and change the way they think about the way they think so they can determine more effective ways to do the things they do. And uh, what that means is I'm not involved in my clients' lives for lengthy periods of time. Uh, I did some stats over about 500 clients going from the startup conversation to the, well, let's not make any more appointments now because you're doing so well, come back if you need to mm-hmm. conversation, and it was under six sessions. Uh, 5.7, I think, was the number. I would imagine. What, what, what do you think the industry standard would be? I, I honestly don't know because there's no open stats mm. available to it, but in my conversations, well, well, I'm required to do 30 hours of professional development every year uh, by law, mm. and that means I get to rub shoulders with a lot of other psychologists, and I'm interested in this stuff. And so I ask my peers what their experience is. Uh, I, I, I doubt that you'd know this, but about two years ago, the government slashed the number of Medicare-funded sessions for psychology from a, a maximum of 18 per year to a maximum of 10 per year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my colleagues are and can, were and continue to be fairly upset by that because the anecdotal evidence I get from conversations with colleagues is that they have much longer conversations with their clientele. Um, now, that's absolutely not uh, hard and fast empirical evidence. It's just the observations of what other psychologists are telling me personally. Um so I'm guessing that it's going to be up around the 15 to 20 mark. Um, and uh, having said that, I'm, I haven't spoken to that many psychologists who practice the kind of psychology that I do. Uh, and, and I don't think we need to get distracted by that, Tim. But yeah, right. uh, yeah, there, there's no kind of industry data that I'm aware of on that basis other than getting impressions from what other uh, psychologists are telling me. One of the things that it sounds to me, just going back to one of the earlier marketing tactics you employed, which was getting in front of GPs, Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a mate who's a chiro, uh, and I've spoken to a number of people who have tried to get their business offering in front of a GP, and that is tough because a GP's uh, by nature, uh, by experience, they're not necessarily commercially minded and they are flat out. They are flat out. So I'd like to have a discussion about how do you get past the Doberman? And this can apply whether you are someone, you have a business listeners trying to get in front of a GP or just have a business that you're trying to get in front of someone that's really, really hard to get in front of. That's a fantastic question. I'm so glad you asked it, Tim. <laughs> um, when I mentioned uh, marketing to the GPs, I, I, I completely overlooked, and until you asked that question, forgot the fact that I also marketed to the practice managers, to the uh-huh. government. Two very and, different people. Absolutely, and they were different letters. They, they, the Dobermans are much more approachable. You can get face-to-face with the Dobermans relatively easily mm-hmm. because they see themselves as a uh, as a funnel to get legitimate information through to the GP. And uh, my experience with the commercially-oriented Dobermans, uh, and I'll call them practice managers, that's because the Dobermans are a pejorative <laughs> term, <I guess. laughs> and, the, the, and, and the majority of them are wonderful people who yep. have got everybody's best interest at heart. But um, uh, the practice managers who have a commercial orientation are willing to talk to someone like me because they can see leverage for their practice. And as evidence of that, only this week I was uh, approached out of the blue by a practice manager from a practice where I don't get a huge amount of referrals, but this person, this woman uh, contacted me saying, we're thinking of starting up an initiative where we get a chiropractor, a physio, and a psychologist to come in and talk to a group of our patients uh, just about you know, uh, uh, good health, no, sorry, dietitian, physiotherapist, and psychologist mm-hmm. about good eating habits, good posture habits, and good psychological habits. Would you be interested in being the psychologist? 
And, uh, and I said, well, no, I don't think so, really. I'm you know, a bit busy. And I would have jumped at it. And, it, <laughs> uh, and, and that only came out of the blue because in my marketing, I had included the practice managers. Um, yeah. when I, uh, if I need to send uh, any information through, I typically put a little note to the practice manager. I know them all by first name. Uh, and so the network gets that slightly bit larger. And it means if there is an opportunity within a practice for me to uh, to have a face to face with the GPs, the practice managers tend to help me being one of be one of the people that do that. Now, one of the things I think I can generalise about psychologists is that in general, psychologists are very poor at self promotion. Mm. Uh, they they don't want to confidently look someone in the eye and say, "Well, this is the way I would approach such a problem." Uh, and I'm very comfortable doing that, obviously. Mm. And well, you've got that. There's that, and there's also the fact that you've got a whole lot of compliance issues that kind of get in the way. So you don't want to. There's a couple of boats you don't want to rock. Absolutely. Yeah. Just back, that practice manager thing is really interesting, Lindsay, because um, what you're doing there, and I, I've, I've told the story previously that when I was working in advertising at an agency called Cleminger's, Peter Cleminger once asked me, "What am I here to do?" And I said, "I'm here to create advertising, Mr. Cleminger." And he said, "No, you're not. You're here to make the client famous." And I think what you did, correct me if I'm wrong, but you focused on going, okay, well, I need to get to the GP because at the end of the day, that's the person who's going to, to um, refer a patient to me. However, mm-hmm. I need to get to get to the GP. The smartest thing would be to um, woo the practice manager, give them good, solid information that's going to build their practice and make them look good in front of their boss, who's the GP, the owner of the practice. Absolutely, it nailed it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, did you kind of was that was was wooing the practice manager? Was it always about giving them solid facts about how you could help grow their business, or was it sending them um, a, a, a sandwich platter for lunch? Or I experimented with the sandwich platter, and it really went over like a uh, like a lead balloon, like a sandwich uh, platter. The sound, yeah. <laughs> and one of the challenges is that when you're trying to market to GPs and GP practices, you're competing with Big Pharma, uh, and you've got people like uh, Merck Sharp Dome and those sort of people who, who are trying to get them to uh, prescribe Viagra and uh, Prozac and whatever, and they've got massive marketing budgets. They've got dedicated salespeople. So they can, job- they've got probably pretty good sandwiches like smoked salmon and avocado. Absolutely. Yeah, and my cheese and uh, and Vegemite. <laughs> cheese and Vegemite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. However, it. what I what I do what I any time I do and anyone who is starting up any sort of a small business, initially they're going to have a bunch of spare time on their hand. That is their goal. That's the currency that they've got to spend on their business. And in those first few weeks and months or so. I, I, I saw myself as having uh, an eight-hour day to work with, and initially I was seeing uh, you know, maybe one or two, three clients. I would then spend the rest of the day dropping in on clinics, uh, sending emails, looking for opportunities, uh, trolling the internet, looking for internet, interesting stories to send to the practice manager about maybe um, cutting, cool. cutting-edge practice management. Trying so to make surfing, myself, surfing the internet. Oh, what did I say? <laughs> trolling. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to tell me there's a, 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 bad, a bad connotation to the you, term troller. <laughs> you, you look it up. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, and so uh, I invested the thing that I had most of early in, in the, in the uh, situation, which was my time, uh, in order to invest in my business. And so I really started off with no money. Um, <clears throat> thankfully, my the, the people who are willing to refer to me are beyond being bribed because that would have been illegal anyway. Um and the practice managers were not looking for anything other than someone to, uh, to to genuinely like them, to engage with them, and to invest time and energy in them. And uh, you know that that was a real accelerant for me getting um, getting business. Mm, fantastic. Let's um, move on from the Dobermans and hello to all you Dobermans out there. I know you listen. Tell me, um, <laughs> compliance is um, something that. Um, puts a bit of a cobwash on the marketing of a business like yours. And I hear this uh, from insurance brokers. I hear it from financial advisors, Lindsay, that there's a whole lot of compliance issues that your industry sets that stop you from, you know, really going hammer and tongs in promoting yourself. Uh, You have, I understand, (coughs) sailed close to the wind on maybe one or two (laughs) occasions. Uh, I'm not sure how much you can say or, you know, but, but... yeah, what's your view on all that and how well, you, how you, not, to, you don't get around it, but how do you manage it? I'm happy to share the experience where I actually got a very minor rap over the knuckles. Oh, here we go. The, 
uh, the, the network of psychologists that uh, that I created in Melbourne in the early 1990s, uh, we came up with a slogan for it because uh, um, psychology wasn't in the news. There was all those kind of things. So we came up with this slogan that this network that we we're producing uh, was going to provide better access to better counselling. And in my naivety, I believe that meant that I was promoting psychologists, mm -hmm. and therefore that's where the better access to better counselling would come. But the uh, professional body uh, of which I'm still a member took umbrage at that, sent me a legal letter saying that I was inferring that my psychologists were better than any other psychologists, and I had to stop using that catchphrase immediately. Mm -hmm. So that's how kind of fragile and, uh, dare I say, precious the industry might be. Ask for forgiveness, not permission? Well, see, you get away with it once, Tim. <laughs> yeah, correct, <laughs> correct. Oh, I love a bit of courage in business. Um, now, listen, we, we, I want to move on, uh, but I, I can't because I think you, did you say you wanted another joke, another psychologist joke? Okay. I okay. think my life would be poorer for not hearing your next joke. Tim. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, doctor, I feel as though nobody understands me. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's hopeless. <laughs> I, I do love the question, does the name Pavlov ring a bell? Oh, if only we had the time, I could really talk to you about Pavlov. I still use Pavlov in my practice. I have no doubt. You, you, yeah. can, you can come on a, a forum. That would be far too mechanical. You can come on a small business big marketing forum webinar and bore us to – I mean, inspire us with, uh, with your Pavlov learnings. Tim, I don't, th I don't think I've ever uttered a boring word. Do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. You haven't. I have. I have no doubt I have. Hey, now, Lindsay, you um, – I love it. I mean, what I hear from all that is that um, – you have just done some good old solid business building, relationship building, provided quality service, quality follow-up. Um, you've gone about it the right way. This is quite a refreshing discussion because I know on the Small Business Big Marketing Show, we talk a lot about online marketing. Um, but every time I have a what I call an old school episode, um, people do enjoy it because it's, it, the, the, world, we, the world doesn't live online. Well, it kind of does, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. as, as the father of three teenagers, yes, it does. But um, from a, the marketing world, I, I love how the two um, live alongside each other. Now, you've grown your business. You've got a successful practice. Um, it's booked solid, but you have realized from what I understand that there is only 24 hours in the day. This is another epiphany that you've had at some point in time, yeah. and it's now time for you to leverage your time. Fair? That's a very, uh, very apt way to describe the change that I'm going through at the moment. Mm. Yep. Uh, yes, I, uh, I get to see around 300 new clients a year, uh, and that's a lot of people. I love being part of the development and change process of those 300 people, but it's also an an infra an, a frustratingly small number of people. Uh, and so I'm trying to uh, – my wife has been saying for a number of years, we need to bottle Lindsay. Uh, and uh, so I've attempted to do that. I've just got a, uh, a book going into the editing process. Well uh, it's, its working title is Why Clever People Do Dumb Things. Uh, and it's an attempt to, uh, to, to put down on paper the way I approach my psychology work. And so I'm hoping that that will not only – allow the book to be in, um, me to be in other people's possession. Uh, but I'm also hoping to ultimately get into keynote seminars, training, webinars, podcasts. That's the, next, that's the next stage of development that we're working to go through. Love it. So one to many. We love one to many. So off the back of the book, um, fantastic to hear a lot of colleagues writing books. Um, maybe just very briefly, Lindsay, uh, well, let me ask you, was it, was it hard to write a book? The writing was relatively straightforward. I, uh, I lent in. Uh, I set my alarm for an hour early every day, and uh, I, I've, I've got a little um, Surface Pro. It is from the dark side, but it's an elegant piece of equipment. And uh, I just uh, literally sat up in bed at 5.30 in the morning and typed for an hour. Oh, and your wife would have – Sarah would have loved that. She acted well. How, you romantic. She, <laughs> I'm struggling how to respond. Yeah, to that exactly thing. right. And all she, <laughs> well, you should just be ashamed. 
I'm having a Homer Simpson moment. Don't make any sexual in the end. In the those <laughs> <laughs> Correct. The, the, so, the reality was she found it very comforting because she uh, reported that every click of the keyboard, it was another dollar going into our future bank account. Exactly. Well, she, you were one step closer closer to bottling yourself, so you were kind of fulfilling her her wish. So, um, yeah, that, great. An hour earlier. I mean, again, you know, like just to digress. I mean, there is. I mean, some one of the limiting beliefs around marketing and about, around building one's business is that. We don't have enough time. And mm. I think one of the harsh realities is, you know, there's time that we have that we're using poorly. Um, maybe that hour of watching a TV program versus an hour of smashing out, you know, 500 words for your book is, is smart. Um, and someone explained, and I, I need to, I need to kind of reflect on this more, but someone did say to me recently that time expands and contracts as you choose. So, yeah. you know, I think what they mm. meant was that, if we allocate a th- three hours to getting something done, it will take three hours. Oh, that's the that's the Peter principle. That's a, a, there's a, a classic uh, managerial uh, dictum that says any job will expand to fulfil the time allotted to it. Isn't that isn't the Peter principle where you're promoted to the, your the highest level of incompetence? He made both of those statements. He's a smart um, fellow. Oh, please, clever, clever man. Yep. Goodness yep. me. But yeah, his, his lesser known dictum was that if you give a ten minute job twenty minutes to uh, within a week, you'll be just taking twenty minutes. And you'll never get it back to ten. Love it. So you, you're right, and, and it's all about discipline. Sim, can I take one little step back and give you two examples of marketing principles being outside the realm of people who are in doing things by habit? Go for gold. Okay. Uh, the first one relates, and these are both relating to psychological practice. Uh, we are mandated by Medicare when a client is, is, is referred to as under the Medicare process to do feedback letters at uh, session six and session 10 or completion. So there's at least two letters that are mandated to be written back to the GPs. And I've, I use those as uh, marketing opportunities. Uh, I uh, make some personal reflection to the referring GP. Uh, I reflect on the process that the client's done. I give feedback on the numerics that we've gathered uh, and I invite the GP to continue referring to me. Now, I, I met with a colleague who moaned about having to do these letters and uh, and I said I see them as a marketing opportunity and he showed me what he did and what he, he had created a pro forma which he had then photocopied a thousand times and they'd write it each time he photocopied them and he just filled in the blanks. Now, dear Dr. X, Thank you for referring your patient Y. They were referred because of depression and anxiety. They have improved because of the following and the other. And it was, and I said, would you refer to somebody who sent you a letter like that? And he said, oh, they still do. Mm. But that, that's one example that you know, people get locked into their own solutions yep. and don't question what they're doing. And the second was every conversation I've had with every other psychologist, and I think this is a a big principle in my industry. Psychologists always whinge about what we call DNAs, do not attend, where people just make an appointment and just don't show up. Mm-hmm. And that means you just kiss an hour of your life goodbye. And it freaked me out because when I began practice, like my colleagues, I was getting probably an average of 3.5 people a day not turning up. Wow. And it's scary. And I'm a businessman. I can't afford to do that. And so I began to implement processes and I've now got a, a, a fairly sophisticated reminder and follow-up process and I invoke a fee if someone doesn't turn up. <clears throat> so uh, I now, I've, I've done the stats over the last year, I now have 1.8 people a week not turning up. Nice reduction, 50% reduction by the way. Oh no, the other one was per day, not per week. Oh, per, yes, so massive gone, reduction. Yep, gone from the 15 to 20 people a week not turning up to between one and two people a week not turning up. And um, uh, when I share this with uh, with other psychologists, they say, what do you do? And I tell them. And they say, my God, you must spend half your life spending SMSs. <laughs> and I say, oh. I say to them, well, hang on, you currently get, just by your own admission, you get at least three people a day not turning up. Now, if your average charge out rate is $100 an hour, that's $300 a day you're missing out on. I spend 20 minutes a day sending these reminders and doing follow-ups. I'm getting paid $300 a day to do that. Correct. 
opportunity cost. You know, that, just- that, that one about the ref, uh, ref, having to report back to the GP uh, at week six and week 10 and doing it, using those little letters as a, as a marketing opportunity, it raises the uh, idea too of, you know, there are so many marketing opportunities that go – uh, missing without attention, without us paying attention to them. Every time someone comes into contact with some aspect of our business, whether it be our business card, a, uni- a branded uniform that a staff member's wearing, uh, an ad, and meeting someone from your business at a networking event, if, I call them moments of truth. And it's mm-hmm. an opportunity that someone either consciously or subconsciously makes to continue to either do business with you, to research you as to whether they want to do business. And so it's kind of a really good exercise to kind of list what are all those touch points, all those moments of truth where I could have the opportunity to further promote my business. And Mm. for you identifying those letters to doctors where other GPs are either doing templates or, you know, not even considering um, promoting themselves. I've I've actually met a a psychologist who constantly reflects on how little he gets paid or what he does uh, in private practice. And in a, just in a conversation one day, I brought up the issue of these letters, and he rather uh, rather ruefully said that um, he stopped doing them a number of years ago and hopes he never gets caught. <laughs> oh, jeez. Hello to all you psychologists out there. <laughs> hey, Lindsay, uh, we're out of time, mate. This has been gold, absolute gold. Now, you have got your current practice, the psychological advantage is is what you're doing now, but you're about to launch, if you haven't already, uh, a business called The Great Change Maker, which I love the name of. It says what it, it says what you aim to do, yeah. and uh, I really wish you so much success with the launch of your book. Uh, and uh, also hopefully, well, not hopefully, I know woo-woo happens when you start doing stuff like books and podcasts. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd love to, nothing more than seeing you booked out on stage going forward and, and sharing the love with a whole lot more people than you currently are. That's awesome, Tim. Thank you. And it's an absolute honour and privilege to be part of your show. I'm, I'm delighted, the, uh, to be delighted to have done it and really enjoyed the process. Thank you. Pleasure, Lindsay. See you, mate. Good on you, Tim. Bye, mate. What about that team? Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did bring it to you. What a good fellow Lindsay is. Now, top three learnings from that fireside chat. Number one, be clear on who the decision maker is and who's between you and the decision maker. I call that person or persons Dobermans or the Doberman. You know, Martin from um, Fruitbox in episode 198 He also talked about getting past the Dobermans. He delivers boxes of fruit to employees in corporate uh, businesses in corporate Australia. His Doberman is the HR manager, and he goes in through the HR manager in order to get fruit boxes into the kitchens of offices all around Australia, and he had a great strategy for doing that. So likewise for Lindsay, he had also a great strategy for getting past the Dobermans and marketing to them. And I suggest you have a think about who are the Dobermans in your business life and figure out how to get past them to the decision maker. Top tip number two from my chat with Lindsay, use your time effectively. I love how Lindsay was getting up an hour early, getting opening um, some wacky device that wasn't Apple, <laughs> and smashing out his book. So, you know, an hour a day, You know, maybe 500 words within that hour, a 1,000 words. Hey, there's a book in 30 days. I know, easier said than done. But turn off the telly. What are you doing that is just kind of downtime, ineffective use of time and replace it with what I would call a hobby, the marketing of your business? Number three, leverage, leverage, leverage. If you are selling your time, what can you be doing that leverages your time so it goes from one to one to one to many. Now, that is up to you as to how you can do that, but that could be as simple as writing a book. It could be running a webinar, doing live events. It could be starting a forum. Gosh, there's so many different ways of doing it, but think about how you can do it because you've only got so many hours in the day. Team, I hope you loved it. If you did love it, if you didn't love it, if you've got some feedback, additional questions, head over to the show notes of episode 202 at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com 
and leave your comment. I respond to every single comment and I ask that my guest does as well. In fact, the recent episode with uh, Chris Taylor from Actionable Books, uh, we're up to about 37 comments and it's just good discussion there. So I love that. Righto, enough top tips. Let's close out this week's episode. So next week's guest, uh, travel blogger living the dream. That's it. Someone who has started a business, is actually a couple, but uh, Kaz is the one who will be joining me, uh, who is just living the dream, traveling around the world, blogging, and making a decent old living. Let's find out how they do it. That's next week. Uh, I've also got the co-founder of a very popular online bookkeeping software that is using a tertiary education marketing strategy very effectively. It's a strategy I hadn't heard of before, but I love it. So we're going to find all out about that. All out about that? All about that. I don't know. It's getting late in the day. Uh, Now, join the forum. I'm in there every day. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and a very big thank you to Net Registry and 99designs. Net Registry will get your online marketing sorted. 99designs will get you the design you love. Head over to 99designs.com forward slash SBBM for an absolutely brilliant upgrade so that your listing goes to the top of the pile and you get lots and lots of new designs for whatever it is you want designed. Thank you to those sponsors. Enough from me. May your marketing be the absolute absolute bee's knees the best marketing going around it's time to dominate your industry go get them team see you next week you've been listening to the small business big marketing show with tim reed want more marketing goodness then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com